Hey Jody here with WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. I'm welding some aluminum today, some pretty thick aluminum pieces. They're not very big, but they're thick. One inch square stock welded to one inch round stock at 6061 T6. And uh, that requires a good amount of heat. I'm, I'm going to be using a, a slightly underpowered welder today, but I'm going to be adding helium to the argon and it, and it makes it just enough. It's a TIG 175 square wave made by Lincoln. It's a transformer machine, not an inverter, so it doesn't have any bells and whistles on it, no adjustments for frequency or AC balance or any of that stuff. But by adding helium to it, it's like it turns it into a whole nother machine. You know, it, it's, uh, it's just enough power to melt this right away and get going right away and not have to wait around, wait around, wait around for a puddle like you do sometimes if, you're, if you don't have helium and you don't have enough amps. This is what the finished part looks like. This is from a run that I did a couple of years ago. And you see it's got a little, in that recessed area, a, a strip of Delrin or something like that. Here's a quick look at the drawing. The red arrow pointing to the weld symbol. And you can see it only calls for 120 thousandths fillet weld. Now there's a little lip on the right hand side on the small part with the, with the bevel on it. And uh, so that's the reason for the small weld. But that's the way they were done the first time around. We did a run of these a couple of years ago. And this small part, the machining was done beforehand, before the welding. This time around, we're going to do them a little bit differently. The machinist just decided it would be easier to do that machining operation after all the welding's done. So we're just welding round parts today. I'm using a strong hand tools fixture point table, and I'm setting up a little, sort of a little quick, quickie fixturing station on the corner of the table. Nothing, nothing complicated at all, just with some simple clamps. Something I can get the part in and out of quickly, get a couple tacks on it, get done. This is a, this is a V pad. This particular one has magnets on it. Very handy to have a bunch of those around. And you can see I can, I can fixture this part up really quickly. And that's a third hand tool right there. It's called, that's a nickname for it. It's a very common little hand tool that, that welders make. This one was sent to me by somebody as a gift. It's a solid copper one. Uh, I, wish I, I wish I could find his email and thank him, but if you're listening, thank you very much for the solid copper third hand there. Very handy. Uh, today I'm, oh, I'm going to use a little, a little uh, clamp here just to make sure the part doesn't move around because it doesn't really take me any longer to use this clamp than it does the third hand and I can get my torch in there just fine. So you can see it's not a very complicated setup but I'll be able to get tacks on parts really quickly. Now I don't always use aluminum cleaner but when I've got a lot of parts to do like this and it's new aluminum a lot of times I'll use this Dynaflux aluminum cleaner just spray it on with a spray bottle and, and do a little scrubbing with Scotch-Brite rinse it off and dry it real good and it helps. I'm using this TIG 175 square wave today. Very simple machine. Basically, you just select polarity, process, amperage, and go. And uh, I really like it. And especially when you mix a little helium in with it, it turns it into a beast. Okay, so this is the helium setup, the Y setup that I use. I've got check valves in line, lots of clamps, lots of fittings, but it's a one-time expense. And I don't use much helium. So the helium's on the left there, and I, actually that's more than what I typically use. I just barely crack the, the ball, just barely float the ball on the flow meter, and that makes a cylinder of helium last me probably a couple of years. And so it's, it's well worth what it cost me to, to get it. And I typically on aluminum with this machine, I'll prep the electrodes something like this. Sometimes I'll ball it a little bit on a piece of copper. When I say ball it, I don't, I don't really put a ball ball, just round the tip, try not to get the tip any bigger than the diameter of the electrode, and that works pretty good. So we'll get some tacks on this thing. And I'm using a 17 air-cooled torch, so I'm pushing the limits because I'm going to be wide open at 175 amps for most of the welding today. This torch is rated at 150 amps. I'm going to be pushing it to 175, but only for short durations. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. Now, you saw a little bit of porosity in that tack. Here's a quick tip for preventing porosity when you start on aluminum. Just let that cleaning action cook a little while for, you know, three or four seconds before you ever puddle. And then add rod. And that gives things, that gives uh, any moisture any hydrocarbons or oxidation on the surface gives it a chance to cook away and then you can get rolling. All right, let's finish getting the tacks on this piece. I'm just putting two tacks on each side and then I'm going to put it in a positioner and just go. 
and you can see my little setup there makes it makes it pretty easy to run through these things and get a total of four tacks on each one and actually this would be not a bad way to weld them if I didn't have a positioner I could put it in this little trough here and just kind of rotate it and weld about half of it at a time okay we'll run through it real quickly here another one just to show you how easy it is to, to set something up on this table and and fixture it and get tacks on something so now I've got them all tacked up two tacks per side it's time to put them in the positioner and weld them out now you can see my positioner has a through hole now that comes in really handy for parts like this where I can slip the part all the way down in there but the main thing is it allows you to purge tubing stainless tubing things like that by by running a purge hose through that thing all right, here's a quick look at the at the starting of the arc. Well, I've got the tack just a little bit inboard so that things don't pop loose when I melt the tack. And then when things heat up, get the positioner going and start knocking these things out. You ever have one of those days when you just can't get comfortable and things just don't go right and you're shaking all over the place even though you're propping on something? <laughs> that's that's what what was happening on this day. But a little shake never hurt anybody, and sometimes it actually makes the weld go in a little bit better. As long as you stay the course, don't don't try to chasing things all over the place. So positioner welds are nice. Not everybody can afford a positioner, but when I take in work like this, I get 20 or 30 parts or even 10 parts. It sure is nice. I know that I know that that it's not worth it for everybody, but it is for me. I bought this positioner. Uh, 15 20 years ago never never regretted it all right after doing all 13 of these parts maxed out at 175 amps the over temp light finally came on when I when I just when I finished the the very last bead <laughs> I pushed this little welder pretty hard the torch got pretty hot in my hand occasionally I had to stop and let it cool for just a minute but as far as the welder goes it definitely passed the test most of the time when I do a video like this where I'm doing uh, a little short production run of parts for a machine shop, I get questions on how do you know what to charge for parts? And I'll tell you, that really comes with experience, but there is a little formula, a very simple formula that can keep you out of hot water. And you, you, just, have to, you just have to try it and you, you might lose money on the first job. But eventually, very quickly, you figure out how to, how to bid a job. And what, what I do is this. I charge a certain amount per tack weld along with a certain amount per linear inch. Now I started out with a buck. 25 years ago or so when I, when I got my first sinker wave 250, uh, that's how I would bid work. If somebody would say, hey, what do you charge for this? I could, in, in, in a few minutes, if I was looking at the actual part, I could figure out the number of tacks within reason and the number of inches of weld on the part. And if I bid it a buck per tack and a buck per inch, I did really well. Now, that was, that was 20, 25 years ago, like I said, so that, that it could be different today, and it depends on material type, it depends on process. TIG welding is what I'm talking about here. A buck per tack, a buck per inch, I could make money. So let's say, for instance, the part that I just welded. It's one inch round, but I didn't go quite all the way around it, but it's the same thing almost. It's, only, it's a matter of seconds to make it all the way around. So anything round, multiply it times three. Pi is 3.14 something. Uh, three is close enough uh, to give somebody a ballpark figure and not and not get yourself in a bind. So on this particular part, there's four tacks, and let's say there was six inches of weld, so that's four plus six, ten bucks per part. You know my positioner goes about one RPM, so one minute per weld, actual arc time, you know, it makes me finish the whole part in way less than five minutes. So if I'm making ten bucks every five minutes, that's not too shabby, right? You can adjust the price per tack and, and the price per inch uh, accordingly if that sounds a little high, but at least it, it'll, it'll help you be consistent. And, it, and it, if somebody shows you something, say, how much you won't just have to say, well, I have no idea. You know, you can, you can in a few minutes say, okay, I'm figuring there's, uh, let's see, 10 tacks, 10 inches of weld, 20 bucks. And that'll, and that'll, keep, you out of, that'll keep you out of trouble. Now, how do you get work? That's another question that, that people ask. How do you get work if you want to start taking inside work or start a, start a small welding business? Here's how I did it, and it was quite by accident. But looking back, here's how I would do it if I had to start today. I'd go find three or four mom-and-pop machine shops, shops that were you know had two or three employees, tops, 
That means they probably don't have a full-time dedicated welder. Eventually they're going to do some high-end stuff that requires welding and it would cost them a ton of money if, it, if, if they gave it to the wrong welder and they screwed it up. Okay, so find those three or four mom and pop machine shops within driving distance, drop them off a little weld sample, could be something as simple as a couple of box cutter blades welded together, could be anything like that. Having something like that is way better than just having a card. But drop off a little weld sample and a card with your contact information. First off, you, first off, you've got to be capable of doing the work. You, last thing you want to do is take on some expensive part and screw it up. Okay, so first thing, you've got to be able to do the work. But if you are able to do the work, you drop off a, a little couple of box cutter blades welded together along with your contact information. You give them the assurance that you are dependable. And uh, when they call you, you call them right back. And if you do a good job for them and turn the parts, you'll get the repeat business. There was a time when I had three machine shops on the hook like that, along with a day job, and man, it was all I could handle. It was all I could handle. But it was worth it. You learn more by taking in side jobs than you will just working for somebody, usually, unless you work in a job shop. All right, that's it for this week. I hope some of this helped. See you next time.